one of the key key architect of um, the platform and building block in India, and Mike, who is known as the guru in the edtech space from the World Bank. And then we'll hold over to you to discuss um, um, and engage with each other and connect. Throughout, we'll have mini reflection points and um, mini polls. Um, so bear with us as we test that technology. So let's kick off by um, looking at who's in the room and what do you already know about, um, about building blocks. So in the chat, can you please add um, your name and introduce yourself, your role and the country that you're based in. And then once you've done that, we're going to do a little bit of a poll in, in trying to understand who's in the room and their knowledge about building blocks. So score yourself one if you think building blocks are about Legos and score yourself five if you're actually building, building blocks all of the time and are very, very familiar with them. I'm hoping the technology is going to work and you will see the Zoom poll coming up for um, your responses soon. I can see the Zoom activity. We'll give it a few more seconds so that everybody else has the chance to comment. Some of you are not engaging with the, um, with the poll and that's okay too. Right, so we have a mixed ability group. Some of you were like where I would put myself in the early stages of understanding the terminology, the vocabulary and their use. There is one person who is extremely proficient. I think that might be Shankar. Um, let's move on, unless the team suggests we wait a little bit longer. Okay, we have representations from across the world and across the sector, from um, researchers, policy makers, developers, and um, technical consultants, as well as donors. And that's great to see. Um, to look and um, reflect on what we will be doing, let's deep dive a little bit more into the event outline. We'll start with Yomna and Taskeen, researchers from the EdTech Hub, who will talk us through the research and their findings on the building blocks. And then we will have, as I mentioned earlier, Shankar Murawada from EPSEC Foundation in India, who will talk about the building block approach to education in India, platforms that have been developed there, but importantly, how it's used to really inform the teaching and learning process. Mike Chokana will then reflect on what we've heard. So a little bit more listening in the first half of the presentation, and then we will take your questions. Please do use the chat facility to um, type in your questions. We will um, draw on these questions for the Q&A session. And if there's some really interesting questions that we don't get a chance to, which we are not given there's nearly 100 people in the room, we will think about doing a Q&A um, response document later. And then for the part five of this session, you will break out into groups of 10 to 12 with a facilitated discussion on key aspects of what you've learned, what your um, key reflections are, and also importantly, what would you like support on in the uh, aspects of building block that the tech hub might respond to. And then we will finish. So without further ado, let's... Um, kick off with the findings of the um, landscape review that Yomna and Taskeen did, 
Yomna is pursuing her doctoral research on education for refugees and disabilities at the University of Cambridge, and she's the editor-in-chief of the Cambridge Education Research Journal. Dr. Thaseen Adam is completed her doctorate um, research also at the University of Cambridge and um, on massive online, massive op open online courses, MOOCs, and how they can support marginalized groups. She's a research, senior research lead at their tech hub. So over to you two for helping us to learn about um, building blocks and how they can support education um, development. Thank you very much, Asia, for that warm introduction. And I'd like to also echo Asia's warm welcome to everybody for joining us here today, for making the time to be with us. Uh, I'm Yomna, and Tasin and I co-authored this report along with Bjorn Hassler and Marius Kodea, who are also with us on the call today. And we'll be presenting some of EdTech Hub's research on uh, using building blocks for digital education platforms in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we'll start off by talking about some definitions of what building blocks are and how education systems can potentially benefit from them. And then we'll go into case studies of using building blocks for EMIS and Sub-Saharan Africa. And as we do, we'll be talking about examples from Open EMIS and DHIS2. And I know that we have colleagues from these organizations on the call today. So um, it's a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, and then I'll hand over to Tasseen to talk a bit about stakeholders, um, how they play a part, and how to assess a country's readiness for using building blocks. Throughout, we'll have activities, so quick Zoom polls like the one we did in the introduction. So stay tuned, and we look forward to seeing your engagement. So first of all, a bit of background on why we did this work. So earlier in the year, our team at EdTech Hub and our partners at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation noticed that people around the world from government, civil society and the private sector are developing digital education platforms. And they often need similar platform components, such as dashboards. When they do this, people either go one of two ways. They, they either build bespoke platforms from scratch, which can be expensive or time consuming, or they use an off the shelf solution, which might not be 100% tailored to their needs. And we wondered, what if we could understand which platform components such as dashboards or building blocks are needed in education platforms and how we can use them. And we thought that if we did this, then possibly we could reduce duplication and increase the quality of education platforms and conserve resources so that we could lower the cost of digital education platforms and ultimately increase access to more people and maximize the ben benefits of using digital education platforms. So we set out to explore this. We investigated the existing and potential use cases of open source modular building blocks to build digital education platforms in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we did this through a combination of continuous desktop research, including reviewing documents and reviewing platforms, and semi-structured interviews with key informants in multiple countries and with multiple platforms and with donors. So now we'll jump into a bit of the definitions of what building blocks are and how education systems can benefit from them. So as we were saying, education systems around the world typically need um, similar education platforms, such as education management information systems and learning management systems, but they need solutions that are tailored to their context. And when they build platforms, countries usually either build something bespoke, which can be expensive and it can be time consuming, but they have full ownership over it, or they use an off-the-shelf solution, which might not be tailored to their needs and they might not have ownership over all of the data. So we're saying that building blocks are a middle ground. They're pieces of software that are already built, but you can adapt them and tailor them to build an overall platform that's tailored to your context. So we'll explain this in a bit more detail. Building blocks themselves are open source, modular, interoperable pieces of software or code that can be used and reused to build and tailor platforms. And when we say modular design, this means that there are different parts which are constructed separately and used to construct a whole piece or a whole platform. So each building block performs a certain function in the platform, such as data collection, and together they form a tailored platform. So it's kind of like the parts of a car where each part, like the engine or the steering wheel, performs a certain function and overall they make the whole car function. And the platform is the final tool that you would use, such as the website for the application. 
So building blocks can be either standalone, which means they provide functionality on their own, or they can be integrated into other applications, so they're interdependent. And they, we can, they provide configurations, so you can customize their functionality to tailor it based on the use case. And they can be integrated with other platforms, usually through an application programming interface. So building blocks can be either user-facing or non-user-facing. So it might be something in the back end of the platform or something that the users interact with. And building blocks aren't, for example, plugins for a particular platform such as WordPress. They're typically um, blocks that can be configured for multiple uses and for multiple platforms. So moving on to the benefits then, how can education systems potentially benefit from using building blocks? First of all, building blocks reduce the cost of plat platform development because they're already partially developed and you're not developing from scratch. Secondly, platforms can be tailored, adapted, and customized to meet the specific needs. Thirdly, uh, they can reduce the time taken to develop platforms because some of the development is already partially complete. Fourthly, platforms can easily integrate with other systems because they're interoperable and because they often have APIs to allow users to do so. They can reduce duplication of coding efforts, so more of the coding efforts can be channeled towards technical advancements in the field. And finally, they leverage code that has already reached maturity, been debugged, and often is quality assured. So we were looking for building blocks in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we didn't find many examples of homegrown um, building blocks in Sub-Saharan Africa, but we did see international examples of building blocks being used. In Sub-Saharan Africa, ministries of education are most likely to build bespoke platforms or use off-the-shelf solutions. And when we asked them why, the answers we got were usually that they were unaware of building blocks or that they had integrity concerns over the use of open source. That said, we did find some examples of international building blocks being used for education in Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you read the full report, you'll see a mapping of some of these building blocks, which you can also potentially use in your own work. So to wrap up this first section, we'll have a Zoom poll, uh, which hopefully Jack will put on screen now. So we have 15 seconds to answer the poll. Which of the following isn't a feature of building blocks? Either based on what you've just heard or on what you already know. Is it that they're interoperable and modular? Is it that they can be integrated with other platforms? That they have an interactive user interface, that they can be standalone or interdependent. It's great to see so many people responding so quickly. <laughs> it's just as a teaser, most people are answering correctly, uh, which is great to see. Maybe it means we've done part of that first section, right? Okay, so let's show the results. So that's right. So most people answered correctly that they have an interactive user interface. So building blocks, like we said, can be on the back end or the front end. So they don't necessarily need to have an interactive user interface, but they can. Okay, great. So we'll move on to the next part where we're going to do a deep dive or on a couple of case studies on using building blocks for education management information systems. And later in the workshop, Shankar from Excep Foundation is going to be sharing some very useful insights on their work using building blocks for teaching and learning. And for now, we're going to focus on EMIS. So Open EMIS is the first example we'll look at, and it's owned by UNESCO and implemented in partnership with ministries of education. Open EMIS provides functional modules that can be configured to meet local needs or integrated with legacy systems. And you can see here on the screen some of the modules that Open EMIS has. So people can pick and choose and use these modules to kind of develop the platform that they need. Some of the modules are dependent on the core, but some are standalone. And most of them have APIs, which can be used to connect them to other, um, to other platforms, for example, legacy platforms. And contributors can develop APIs and plugins to connect each, um, these modules with other systems. And the source code is mainly maintained by UNESCO's own team and the open source community. Yeah. Okay, sorry, my screen crashed. So, so open EMIS uses open source code, which allows countries to adapt the building blocks to their own needs and have ownership over the source code. 
And in terms of its education uses, it's been used for data collection, management, analysis, monitoring, and data analytics. So moving on to some four insights that we've highlighted uh, from Open EMIS about the implementation of building blocks. So Open EMIS typically uses a consultancy model. So Community System Foundation, or CSF, is uh, UNESCO's main implementing partner for Open EMIS. And they provide technical assistance to governments, which typically last three years, but not always. And this helps with the kind of implementation phase and helps to build the capacity of the countries to continue using Open EMIS. One thing we learned from Open EMIS is that people and processes are just as important as technology when it comes to implementing building blocks. So they focus on people, processes, and technology. And the whole technical assistance process includes a policy development, rollout plans, and capacity building, which are critical to the success or failure of building blocks. In terms of hosting, uh, countries can either install the source code on their own servers, which means they own the data, or they can opt for a cloud hosting service offered by CSF and they can access the data um, through an API. And in terms of funding, so Open EMIS is, does have core UNESCO funding, uh, but they also get funding from implementing governments. Okay, so moving on to DHIS2. So DHIS2 for education is coordinated by the University of Oslo. It builds on DHIS2, the DHIS2 structure, which is a health information management system, which has been around for several decades. And again, you can see on the screen some of the modules that DHIS2 offers. And these modules can be used for health and can be used for education. Again, it uses open source code, which allows countries to adapt the building blocks to their needs and have ownership over the source code. And in terms of the education uses, it's been used for student enrollment and attendance, for multi-sectoral analysis, and for resource allocation. So now we're going to highlight three things that we can learn from DHIS2 about the development of building blocks. So DHIS2 uses participatory design. So they have HIST networks based in multiple countries, uh, which support the implementation, the local customization and configuration of building blocks. So, you know, you have a module, say, for data collection, and they help to develop it and code it so it suits a particular context, um, and that supports with uh, capacity building. They also have an app hub. So uh, the app hub contains web applications that are developed by the community, not by the DHIS2 team themselves, which are compatible with the core software system and allow people to expand the use of DHIS2. And they have building blocks, uh, as I mentioned, which are used for both health and education, and they can be coded to suit different needs. And there are no major design differences between the building blocks for health or education. However, in the past, DHIS2 has found that it's been easier to expand for education in a country that already was using DHIS2 for health because the infrastructure and product trust were already there in place. So we'll move on to the next activity now. Um, another Zoom poll which hopefully Jack will launch on screen. So in the context you're most familiar with, uh, how are the education platforms developed? Are they bespoke? Are they off the shelves? Do they use building blocks? Or are you unsure? And again, we'll just have 15 seconds uh, to answer this poll. Uh, and it's nice to see we're getting a mix of results. And just five more seconds to put your results into the poll. Okay. Okay, so it looks like most people are it's quite split actually between using the poke solutions and off the shelf solutions. Uh, and very few about we have had 10 people saying that they use building blocks, which is great to hear. Hopefully in the breakout rooms we'll hear more from you um, about that. So I'll hand over now to Testine to talk a bit more about stakeholders. Over to you, Testine. Thanks, Yimna. Can I confirm you seeing my screen fine? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so we've brought all of you here today to tell you about how awesome technology is and how it's going to make platforms faster and more efficient. So why am I going to dedicate a whole section to talking about stakeholders? 
Well, surprise, surprise, our main finding from the research was that actually more coordination was needed between different stakeholders to design, to implement, to maintain digital, pl digital platforms more effectively. So who are these different types of stakeholders? First and foremost are ministries of education as well as other ministries, and they are instrumental in the platform development as they will be the ultimate decision makers. Um, they will be looking at topics such as platform functionality, types of users, and what is deemed a secure platform. Uh, they also, at least in the ideal scenario, um, are there to train uh, to staff and train software developers and data scientists, as well as education experts. Um, and these are all key players in the digital education platform development. Next, we have donors, bilaterals, and multilateral organizations. And these could fund platform development within a country. And sometimes they work in partnership with the, the government and sometimes not. Um, they may also invest in the development of um, building blocks. Then next we have so uh, software developers and consultants. And here we found that more, uh, that more and more often, um, local consultants and local software developers are being drawn upon, which is actually great. Um, however, the one snag here is that uh, with using external consultants, this, this still means that um, the capacity is not actually retained within the government. And next, we have researchers, and researchers can come from both the education sector and the computer science space, and researchers support uh, the continued development and the improvement of building blocks. Then you have the end users, the most important people, district officials, teachers, learners, their role is pivotal and their engagement, which is often neglected in the design phase, is the ultimate factor which will make or break a platform. And lastly, we have um, edtech entrepreneurs and they can fo focus both on um, the develop, uh, on using and developing building blocks. And they play an important role because they're in the tinkering space. They can bring in innovations in and bring the next, you know, the next big thing in terms of building blocks. So from our research, we found that improved stakeholder coordination was actually what was most necessary to improve building block effectiveness. And the first thing was that more donor coordination was needed. We found that there were multiple and different donors um, who were supporting different projects that had similar functions or who were collecting similar data or they targeted similar users. And this often resulted in existing data that was fragmented and it wasn't centralized. Um, in, sometimes the data was actually contradictory. Um, in addition to, to the duplication, that funding could have actually been better used to build upon what already existed. Then secondly was um, co-creation of building blocks with local stakeholders. Um, and what we found here was that more alignment was needed between the international developers of building blocks, and, the, and I'm saying international because there were no local developers in our, in our research, um, and with local stakeholders. Um, and, and this was because there was a misalignment of the perception of, of the, how uh, the building blocks were expected to work or what the local requirements were. Um, next was quite an interesting finding. Uh, we found that uh, building blocks that had some sort of endorsement or backing by a donor group was actually more used because it had more trust or integrity. So, for example, um, because Open EMIS was backed or was uh, supported by UNESCO, it gave, gave them greater confidence in the product. And lastly, um, while in-country partners were interested and, uh, you know, took to the concept of building blocks, they required more evidence on the cost benefit um, of the product as well as how secure building blocks could be. So let's move on to another activity. Which type of stakeholder group do you align with? So are you, are you from the government? Are you with one of the donor groups? Are you an entrepreneur, an academic, an end user? Let us know who you are. Great, we have quite a big diversity. So we have a lot of developers, a lot of academics, 
And I think uh, similar to what I just said, we're not interacting with end users enough. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And if the box is still up on your screen, you can just click the, the X on the top to minimize the, um, the poll. Um, and that just shows even in this event, we need to be interacting more with end users. Now, um, moving on to discussing considerations that need to be taken to determine a country's readiness to use building blocks effectively. So we, we looked at three readiness condition, con uh, considerations, um, which are funding, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure and technology, and people. And once again, people, 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 looking at the different um, roles that people need to play in this. So onto funding. We lured you here into this event to tell you about how building blocks can help platforms uh, you know, be built cheaper. But in reality, the situation is a little bit more complex. First, funding is needed in other spaces beyond development within the building blocks ecosystem. Um, in order to empower homegrown solutions of building blocks, we also need to invest in the tinkering, this makerspace community. There needs to be room for, for developers and educational specialists to trial and, edge, uh, trial and error solutions um, and use agile development um, principles when developing building blocks. And I think Shankar will also be able to tell you a bit more about the story of XStep in India and, and their experimental processes. Next, funding is also needed to support governments to hire, train, and most importantly, retain staff, including developer staff and data analyst staff. And our findings show that the most often when, uh, when they were well-trained staff, they often left for better opportunities. Um, lastly, sustainable funding is needed for hosting and data storage. Uh, what we found in our research was that once donor funding depletes, uh, the platforms are no longer hosted and then they become obsolete. Now, moving on to infrastructure and technology. Here, the readiness consideration isn't binary and rather it's about ensuring that the appropriate building block uh, is, using, is used um, depending on the infrastructural needs. So for example, if you have connectivity, uh, using connectivity and power to, to determine whether data should be stored on a local server or whether it should be stored online or determining if um, a, digi a digital or paper-based data collection tool may be used. Um, now, a key factor that sometimes is overlooked is to consider first whether the basic infrastructure maturity is met. And quite frankly, what I'm saying here is we need to ensure that funding towards platform development does not divert funding from urgent needs of the country's education system. Now, lastly, back to people. People are critical to the success and failure of building blocks. What we found that was in uh, we found that um, in-house capacity within the ministry was needed to ensure more effective development, implementation, and use and maintenance of the platform. And what was needed was people who could understand how to collect, process, and data, uh, analyze data. Um, there was also a need for low investing in local um, software developer capacity to support the local maintenance and to ensure sustainability um, uh, was achieved. Um, and this developer capacity didn't just need um, normal developers, but developers who understood modular design principles, uh, such as using microservices architecture. Um, then uh, looking at communities of practice, these were needed in the system uh, to ensure uptake, co-creation and sustainability. So these could be developer communities, academic communities, or even donor communities that discussed, for example, policy issues around, around the topic of platforms. Um, and lastly, what we found was that more information and communication feedback loops were key in particular, looping back to school level, the end users, and making sure that they firstly understood how this data collection or this virtual learning environment could be beneficial to them, as well as taking their feedback um, into consideration when developing and iterating. Um, so this is our last Zoom call. So um, Shah, can you pop up that Zoom call for us? And in the context that you're, um, 
most familiar with, which, uh, which of the following do you think is the biggest barrier to using building blocks? And guys, there's no right answer in this one. <laughs> Great, so it looks like people, people, people uh, is coming out on top, but infrastructure and funding as well. Great, I'll give you a few more seconds. So it seems that I've influenced you all with my emphasis on people. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up. And once again, you can click on the X to close the Zoom poll. Um, so in conclusion, um, we didn't find any homegrown examples of uh, building blocks in Sub-Saharan Africa, but um, we did find international building blocks being used such as Open EMIS and DHIS2. Um, stakeholders, uh, our, our, our main focus was on stakeholders and they needed to work and they need to work together in, in order to ensure that building blocks are used effectively. And the context needs to be analyzed in order to show that the funding infrastructure and capacity um, is aligned with the country's needs. So we can't prescribe building blocks for everyone in the exact same way. And what might work in one country may not work in another. And finally, please check out our report. We'll pop the chat into the link. Um, our full report covers four country uh, deep dives um, from Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Kenya, and South Sudan, as well as um, three building blocks, uh, deep dives on open EMS, DHIS2, and Sunbird. And thank you for your time. And while I concede that our um, event title was clickbaity enough to draw you here. And then I said, well, actually, it's not true. I hope um, it was it was good enough and we've helped you read the fine print, so to speak, on building blocks. Over yeah. to you, Asya. Thank you, Yomna uh, and Tuskeen, really appreciate it. And I have to say, I liked your mini, mini polls um, in, in the middle, testing our attention skills as well as raising some um, interesting questions about the difficulty of being able to answer some of those questions because they're big, bigger, bigger questions that Philip mentioned and perhaps that's something that um, the participants can take through in the session later on. I'm just going to give you a 30 second break to reflect on what you heard. There might be questions you want to pose before I introduce you to um, Shankar, who we're delighted can join us. So just 30 seconds of reflection time, um, questions, um, observations from what um, Tuskeen and Yomna said. Okay, Shankar Murawada is the CEO and co-founder of XStep Foundation, and XStep means one step, and I think the philosophy is one stage step at a time. It's a philanthropic mission to improve basic education for 200 million children in India. The scale is mind-boggling. He has more than 25 years' experience across corporate, entrepreneurial, nonprofit, and government sectors, and has been instrumental in setting up India's education platform, Diksha, and working on the even more ambitious national digital education architecture, NDIA. Um, Diksha is one of the largest and most diverse education platforms in the world. Um, and so we really look forward to hearing Shankar's reflections on how building blocks help um, all the way from this, um, the national level down to informing classroom practice. Shankar, over to you. Thank you, Asiya. Uh, good evening, good morning to everybody, wherever you are. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I heard Taskin and Yomna's wonderful analysis, I wish we had the benefit of that when we started our journey. We did not. So what I will share with you is the journey in India over the last four or five years on how we took a building blocks approach to education. As you would know, India is big, it's complex, it's diverse. In fact, the population is almost similar to that of Sub-Saharan Africa. 
and uh, the diversity of languages, culture, socioeconomic context is varies from east east to west and north to south. In addition, we have sixty autonomous boards of education, mostly state, but some central government led and some private each of whom can decide their own curriculum, their own technology, their own content. And therefore, when we started looking at how to think of digital platforms, rather than start with technology, rather than start with what is missing, typically in an under-resourced country, the first instinct is to focus on what is not there, connectivity, devices, content. We started by looking at those pieces that are already there. And textbooks was one of those blocks that every child had. India as a country produces around 800 million textbooks every year. And these are given free to most students. A second behavior that was already common was the presence of QR codes which have gained a lot of usage in the last four years because of the rise of digital payments. So we built off these two, the textbook and the QR code and connected them to digital content and created a bunch of building blocks on the top of which Diksha, the digital platform was created. In a short span of four years, this simple idea resulted in more than 54 billion minutes of learning from over 4.7 billion learning sessions through more than 600 million energized textbooks. These are textbooks which have on an average of 10 to 12 QR codes, where each QR code on a page points to a set of topics, digital content relevant to that topic, which makes it easier to get relevant content for a teacher or a child. Upwards of 200,000 pieces of content in 33 languages, and all of them crowdsource or provided by philanthropies, non-government organizations, or what the governments already had. Not a dollar was spent on sourcing any of them. And all of this content are creative commons, which means anybody can take them and modify them. The reach is as shown below. It is not the full coverage of India yet because there are still many gaps, but in four years, it is quite a start. In India, the diversity of usage of Diksha, as you can see from these pictures, it's in the hands of children, it's in the hands of teachers, it's in, used in classrooms, at homes, in class, as a, via projectors, via personal phones of teachers, via tablets, uh, in some cases through television. These are teachers using it. It's used for assessments here, some cases for practice revision, some cases to understand a complex concept. And here, actually, it is the Urdu script where, which is right to left, as you see this teacher explaining a Urdu piece of content. That's the diversity that Diksha serves currently. In addition to these usage scenarios, each state, and India has 36 states and union territories, each state is like a mini country. Each state was free to decide which grades it wants to use Diksha in, what languages it wants to use Diksha. So as you see, state number nine started off very cautiously using it only in upper primary. But on the other hand, state number 15, which is a big diverse state, chose all grades across the entire spectrum and in the seven, eight languages that its population speaks in. And that was again, the power of using the building blocks for each state to customize its own solution. Teacher training is another important area. 
most states in india spend around 80% of the state funds on teacher salaries but even then only 10 to 15% of the teachers can get trained offline in a year because of capacity constraints however the pandemic changed all that and teacher training naturally shot up and over the last couple of years around 7 million teachers have completed around 100 million courses over the two years and we know that because each of them got a digitally verifiable certificate each certificate issued by the appropriate authority what was interesting was since they were digital the teachers took to sharing these certificates of completion with their family and community to show how they have been trained and it was like a, a badge that they wanted to share with friends and family as you see the verifiable part of this uses the same qr code building block of energized textbooks that's again the power of using building blocks you reuse what you want create new solutions add a new skin as yomna said the interface is not part of the building block but everybody can create their own interface so that they get exactly the look that they want. Now, in all of this, one of the most powerful building blocks and the first building block that we built was a building block that emits data. That's a building block whose only function is to generate data and keep pinging it. And as a result of that, it is easy in India to see what we call as the MRI of learning. In which parts of India is learning happening more using Diksha? Each of the states get a much more detailed map than this. And the states can use this data to figure out any interventions or any refinements in their implementation. While this is on a geographical basis, the same data and patterns are available across time. So this gives you, and that's very, call it the ECG of learning, the usage of Diksha across time of day and across days. As you can see, it dips on weekends. It peaks at around 8 p.m. every night and uh, again dips on weekends. And uh, so this data is available by the minute at an aggregated manner. And therefore, it allows policymakers to understand what kind of content is more popular, why, what time of day is more popular. Is there a variation? in usage across weekends, weekdays, week variation around the time of exams, before, after, during holidays, et cetera. And because of this data, what is possible is improvement cycles. And this is a very, very important point. Another building block allows digitization of answer papers. So as a result, in one of the states, every week around 3.5 million teacher, children are graded by 100,000 plus teachers and the answers are entered in paper sheets like these. And a sophisticated AI-based algorithm in the form of an app provided to the teachers allows them to scan the marks of each child, which digitizes it and and then the teacher can change it if there's any error, which is happens 1% of the time. As a result of this, this allows the entire state to see learning outcomes at the level of a district down to a block cluster and down to school, and also by learning outcomes. So which learning outcomes are those that the entire state is not doing well? Which are the districts which are not doing as well as others? And this seeing allows the state to act in multiple ways. So in a sense, we are also talking about assessment informed instruction, but it's not just about instruction. It is teacher training, upgrading, teaching, learning materials. The, the lot of tools are available at, for the state and it can see which of those tools are working because the next time the same test is conducted in the same subject, they can see whether the learning outcomes have improved or not. 
And that's why this is a cycle. It won't happen in one shot, won't even happen in a year. It'll take multiple cycles. And that's how the state can improve basis the data being emitted. These are a set of the eight building blocks, the main building blocks in Sunbird, the open source that XTEP initially funded and created. Now there are many other community members who created. If you go to sunbird.org, a lot more details are there. And these building blocks allowed the creation of many types of solutions on Diksha as I showed you. And Diksha itself is one platform. There are all these other platforms, each in a different context, each owned by a different entity who have their own data. In fact, two of these platforms, Coven and Divok, have nothing to do with education. They are part of India's COVID response and uh, COVID has been used to issue 1.75 billion digitally verifiable vaccination certificate over the last one year. Again, as Yamna said, take what is already there, build on top of that. Technology is necessary, but is not sufficient. One needs all of these other components. But the good news is a lot of them would already be available in other countries, especially the digital parts like content. All of the content on Diksha is available for anybody. Taxonomy, learning outcomes, obviously the school infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, the connectivity, et cetera, is a different ball game. At scale, institutional structures matter. So India used its existing institutional structures with the ministry as a sponsor and in uh, Central Institute, the National Center for Education Research and Technology as the owner and various coordination committees created. And XTEP was a part of the Diksha PMU in addition to helping to create the core uh, technology platform for the government as a philanthropic partnership. Building of Diksha a few months ago, the country also launched a technology blueprint for building blocks, which Asiya mentioned. And a lot of work was done. An exhaustive list of 36 building blocks have been identified, which are mentioned here and more details are there on the uh, website mentioned below. And these 36 building blocks, which pretty much cover the entire gamut have been arranged around the four main actors in education the parents, the administrators, the teachers, the most important being the children, and around the three critical interactions in education, which is learning, help learn, and manage learn. You can access the policy report, and I know that some of the countries are looking at reapplying some of the thinking from the policy uh, report. But what this does is it lays down a strategic direction on how to think about building blocks at the level of a country across the entire education sector. In summary, if there is a recipe, it has three parts. First, adopt and adapt. Take what exists, take what you like, build on it or modify it and add on what is not there. This is nothing new. This is how we have built our houses and buildings for thousands of years. This is how we build cars. They're all made of building blocks that you take and put it in the way that you want. The second, and this is very important, existing systems should not plug into technology. We should not expect existing actors and institutions to walk a mile to use technology. Technology should blend in with existing systems, the technology should plug and play into the planned programs and the policies. And third, when you have data, you don't need to start with perfection. You can start with what you have and keep improving through data-led coordinated action cycles because as we know, oftentimes perfection can be the enemy of good. Perfection can result in a state of paralysis 
we saw it was better to start with what was there and keep improving and keep building on uh, guided by data. I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to share the India experiences with all of you. Shankar, thank you so much. Um, it is great to hear the, the theory and, um, and what should happen that Yomna and the scheme talked about to practicalities of what's been achieved in such a remarkable, remarkably short time um, in India. So I'm going to turn to Mike now. Mike Tricano is the Senior Education and Technology Policy Specialist at the World Bank and the Global Lead for Education in, um, and Innovation in Education. And he works on the intersection between technology use and education in low and middle income countries and emerging markets. Mike, we heard so much um, and I'd like your help in making sense of it. Some of my reflections are this part about building blocks being parts of the car then also the question about where is the car going what is destination how fast should it go we heard reflections on the integration between health and education and and what already exists um, in governments and, and the importance of stakeholders and particularly those who are working on um, supporting the digital talent um, locally and in country and from Shankar we heard about the massive scale um, and how to integrate this by making it by making use of existing things and making it easy to use and I particularly liked his focus on learning I think sometimes that's missing when we're talking about technology about what purpose does it serve so what's your three big takeaways from what you've heard so far uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, thanks so much, Asya. Um, thanks, Tuskeen, Yomna, Bjorn, Marius, and the team from the EdTech Hub for this really useful, I think, uh, uh, just laying out of, of what this approach is, what this metaphor is, and starting to unpack it for us. And to Shankar and the team at XStep, who uh, I think continue to provide uh, practical inspiration and guidance for all of us trying to think about uh, um, how we can deliver educational products and services um, better more quickly, more cheaply. And, you know, it was interesting when I saw the um, people came up, how they sort of self-identified it. it. One fifth of people said that they self-identified as developers, whatever that means, uh, and 80% don't. But I suspect that most everyone here today is probably at least developer adjacent. And I mentioned that because I think this building blocks metaphor is a powerful one. And I don't know how many times, for example, that Shankar, Yomnar, or Tuskeen use the word build or building or builder. But from a builder's perspective, I think this is just a super valuable way to think about how we can do things more quickly, more cheaply in a way that allows for uh, um, interaction, interoperability. Um, but I think a big challenge a lot of us have had in trying to uh, share lessons from this experience, and we've certainly experienced this at the World Bank with other countries around the world, is that most people aren't builders in the way that we're talking about. And these are metaphors from software development. And how can we translate these metaphors from software development to people who are, in a sense, buyers? And there's a buyer's perspective here. And I think that one of the big challenges, you had listed uh, a number of challenges uh, um, to the adoption of this sort of uh, approach to building. Um, and, you know, I think uh, there are other ones as well. Um, I mean, there's just basic inertia, the way people are used to thinking about how they solve their own problems. And there's a reason that people just want to buy stuff, I think. Um, they go beyond even some of the things that are listed here. It's they want to hold someone to account easily. And they want to say, if something goes wrong, I know it's your fault. I understand what I'm buying. And to take a step back and from a Ministry of Education perspective, to think about how can we put in place, I guess, the building blocks in our education system, in our tech sector, to en enable the types of developments and the types of processes and to empower the, the people um, who are uh, fundamental to all this. How can we put all those together in a place like India, where we have um, very sophisticated institutions and people and technologies to develop and thinking about how we learn from that experience and bring it to a place where those things, none of those things are in evidence to the same extent, what can we still do? And I think the X step approach in conceptualizing uh, or sharing information about this through, as, as Shankar said, through these energized textbooks, like here's something you can think about buying. Here's something tangible that you can see. Now, 
if you would like that, here's a way to build it. Here's maybe a way that you can incentivize groups or procure parts of it, as well as with the, the Dick Shop platform as well, to think, to get people to understand, like, this is what you buy in the end, and selling that and not the process as a way to sell the process. And I think that is a challenge that many, you know, in the early days of, of COVID, we had uh, um, some, you know, emergency meetings with every Ministry of Education and in talking with the Minister of Education in Indonesia, who comes from a tech background, it took him about three minutes to understand what we were talking about. And we had almost, we attempted to have the same conversation with another country and it went on for days and days and days. And that sort of that, um, the builder perspective versus the buyer perspective, I think is a big challenge for a lot of us as we try to think about how to uh, incentivize government to put in place the rules and regulations and processes um, that can make this stuff happen and not get in the way of it as well. You know, one last thing I just, you know, in some cases where um, there are not the rules and regulations around uh, security and data privacy and those types of things, it's actually a big enabler of this type of approach early on, but then it becomes a big inhibitor because then you realize that we don't, there are certain building blocks of, of policy and regulation and just way of, of thinking that aren't there as well. Um, so that's something else that strikes me um, um, from this as well. And so I want to end with just thinking about where do we start and maybe throwing it back to Shankar and other places thinking about if you're not India or if you're not Indonesia or if you're not Germany and thinking about how do we conceptualize the way we buy and incentivize the development of, of ed tech products and services when we don't have all these pieces that are laid out in some of these slides? And how do we as a, the organizations that support groups who are trying to do that, how can we help them in the early stages? I think those are challenges and these are, these are challenges that, that we at the World Bank are, are, are literally struggling with every day. Mike, I really like how you phrase the, the, the builder versus the buyer. There is, uh, the technology is developing such, so fast and such a rapid space, um, a rapid pace that even thinking about how it can serve the, um, the purpose, the educational purposes, including how it improves teaching and how it improves um, learning. So there's this aspect of how do we make what's abstract more concrete? Um, and I would, I, would, I would just sort of like perhaps push a little bit on this to help us think about what are concrete things we can be doing a tech hub doing, but also in country, we have people here who engage with the tech side, engage with government side as well. How can we make what is abstract more concrete and that leading to more accountability to say, this was supposed to produce this. How do we know it is, um, it is producing it? And if it's not, what do we do about it? Yeah, thanks, Asya. Um, you know what, I, I, again, I'll commend the, the team at the EdTech Hub for, I think, uh, just putting this down in paper uh, and providing us with a language and structure as a way to structure our dialogues and thinking when we try to talk with ministries of education, for example, uh, to think about how they can go about meeting the needs of, of their users, if you will, from a developer perspective, uh, um, uh, students and teachers and, and stakeholders, um, how they can do that um, and providing us with a, a common language and then specific examples. And I think, again, the, that is, you know, the X step example is a, is a great one at a conceptual level, but the energized textbook and the Diksha example of the platform are great from a very practical level. And I think that level of both conceptual sort of uh, uh, big thinking, making it simple, and then the specific documentation, I think is, um, is absolutely uh, critical and vital. And, you know, when thinking about um, the title of this event is about how to develop digital education platforms. And it's not only platforms we're talking about, I think, in the end, I mean, little apps and specific services as well uh, that are delivered via these platforms, because that's how people tend to think, I, I, I think, for the most part. Um, how can we do that cheaper and faster? And what are the key things that we need to do, the key investments we need to make into the, the developer ecosystem into the legal uh, ecosystem into our people and institutions to enable this sort of thing to actually happen cheaper and faster because if you just want to start with the, this sort of ecosystem approach building block approach from scratch i mean it won't be cheaper it won't be faster yeah 
unless you understand that investments need to be a, have been made in certain types of institutions, certain types of people, certain types of relationships. Uh, um, so I think uh, that is another thing that, that jumps out to me is how do we do that and how do we communicate what those types of investments are in a particular place at a particular time to get a particular thing done. Thanks, Matt. I think this is Tuskeen's point about the people and that relationship building and trust building takes time. So we have a, a few questions that came from the chat that I'm going to pick up and I'm going to ask them all in one go and, and, and request the panel to answer them and I'm going to direct them but if other people want to um, engage then feel free to do so. So Lorenzo Rapio asked, um, and Yomna this might be for you, that you mentioned that one of the benefits of building um, benefits of um, having building blocks is reducing cost. Has this been research or is this just an assumption? Um, Shankar, this might, uh, might be one for you to consider. How do stakeholders like officials from Ministry of Education find out about building blocks? Um, and it's something that Michael's just touching on as well. What are the common ways that get to know about building blocks and understand it? Um, this one, perhaps for Shankar, as well as the Tech Hub team from Denver, one of our biggest struggles has been identifying a developer who can adequately advise and support these processes on using building blocks. So what is this way of having a source of that digital talent available? And, and Filio talked about, I think it's Philip, he talked about um, your final question about what are the three you know, important things that you talked about, the barriers is it's all three. So um, what, what's your reflections on these questions? And I'm going to give you no more than seven minutes in total before we shift over to um, the group discussion. Yomna, let's kick off with you. Thank you, Asia, And thanks for the questions uh, in the chat. And I'll answer that question about cost uh, whether reducing costs has been researched or if it's an assumption. And that's a really good question. So at this stage for us, it's an assumption. We assume that by using building blocks, uh, people can reduce costs and that this would be a benefit. But this is absolutely something that needs to be researched because decision makers need this answer. They need to know the cost benefit of using building blocks in order to be able to decide whether it's worth it for them. And the answer to that will probably be context dependent as well, depending on the available developer capacity and the other available solutions um, in the space. Uh, I'll hand over back to you, Asia. So Shankar, how, how do you get state officials and government officials to know about this and use it? First is, uh, for those who have done it, to talk about it. And in a way, that's what we are doing in this conference. And in the government of India has also of late started talking about offering Diksha itself as a digital public good. In fact, the World Bank organized a knowledge sharing confer conference where the Secretary of Education presented to two sets of African countries, one in December 2021, a couple of months ago, and one a year before. So I think multilateral can play a great knowledge exchange role. They can facilitate, they can have these conversations. And uh, of course, the work that Taskin and Yamna did, again, kudos, supported by Gates and World Bank. I think we need a lot more of, as, as Mike said, we need the, the language of conversations. We need the examples, right? We need the opportunities and the challenges. And uh, maybe I'll connect that, Asia, to the other question, which is, to me about developers to adequately support. The bad news is there is no shortcut. Like with any product life cycle, as the product gets mature, as the idea gets mature, more and more people understand it becomes easier for the next lot. But the good news is because these are digital technologies, all developers need not be co-located in the country. So as an example, Sunbird uses 15 to 16 open source technologies in building its own open source. Most of those developers, all of those open source have been developed outside India. And of course, India is blessed with technical talent, but finding out the closest other technical talent or leveraging on developers from India and others to strategically build the relevant talent in Africa is again, something of an investment. It's like harvesting a seed, no amount of 
more adding more water will pop the seed overnight that's the uh, bad news but the last one year we've seen a lot of exciting developments in this area and that encourages me that the speed will now be more it will accelerate more now so very much a case of learning from others who've done before you and learning together and i liked what you said about you don't have to be in country so more of that south south collaboration um will be really helpful okay i am going to um um, to scheme, before we go over to the groups, there's a very short answer to this point about how can we source digital talent? How can we, you know, um, tap into what Shankar was talking about, but also Deborah's question? And, and what role can the hub play in that? So I just want to add a quick point about the costing. Um, I think I touched on it in my presentation where it's not just about funding the specific development of a building block, but about the ecosystem. And so if the ecosystem has more funding, then it's less cost uh, and funding needed for a specific country. And um, I might actually say that if events like this or technical assistance that the EdTech Hub or the World Bank or Central Square, uh, um, CSF could provide, that actually helps to build that developer capacity. Um, in the case of the, the platforms that we use, they often work with um, academics, uh, with researchers and within the developer and the education space, and that helped to grow capacity. And the most successful building blocks were the ones that had these communities around them that created this maker space um, with developers. Hope that answers your question quickly very much okay now we're going to have the promised breakout um, session you heard about the real importance of connecting with each other and learning together so in your breakout sessions you will have a facilitator from the edtech hub team um, give yourself a very short amount of time because we're cutting um, we're cutting this down to 15 15 minutes perhaps 10 if we've got sufficient um, um, give yourself time to introduce each other, reflect on the potential challenges and what is needed, the third thing, what is needed to address those challenges and the support that you would require. So this, um, this building block session came across just wanting to know and understand and then said, decided to have it as a webinar and um, quite a lot of interest on this. What more would be useful to help um, advance um, advanced ed tech in service of improving educational outcomes. So hopefully if the technology works right, you will now be sent to your breakout groups where the facilitator will introduce themselves. You have time to discuss the challenges and also um, um, the look ahead and support required. We'll then come back and we'll have very brief round table from the facilitators on the key thing that everybody needs to hear and then we'll conclude the session. Right, let's see if the tech works. Let's get everybody off to their breakout rooms. I will give 30 seconds more for everybody else to join, and then we're going to have the speediest round table of the key points from um, around the rooms. As we have only five minutes late, and I know everybody needs a break. Okay. So to ski, I'm going to go in the order of the facilitators that I have. So the first five are Tiskeen, Yomna, Bjorn, Salma, and Rachel. You have very short amount of time, maybe 30 seconds. What's the key point from your group? Tiskeen, go to you. Great. The two topics that came out were scale and standardization. Scale in terms of how do we actually um, glue building blocks together? Um, how do we actually have capacity to understand how to you like how do we source these developers that have the knowledge and know-how and then standardization in terms of um, understanding how we can glue different building blocks together. Yomna, same question to you. Oh, I can't. Where is Yomna? Very sorry, my mic and speaker weren't working, but I've reconnected now. So I didn't hear the question, but I did hear you say same question to you. And I'm guessing we're feeding back from the Jamboard. Is that right? Okay, great. So we had a, a nice little discussion and some of the interesting things that came up in terms of looking forward and how a tech up can help is um, 
thinking about how expert talent can be channeled, uh, convening stakeholders and understanding the different needs, uh, sharing information and identifying gaps and thinking about what kind of investments uh, are needed. And in terms of the challenge, a big thing that came up is people how to have the right people at the right place at the right time to make decisions and quality assuring the code and making sure that the whole process is moving and we're not just kind of stuck at the tinkering phase. Uh, thank you, Asya. Thank you. Bjorn? Hi, everyone. Sorry to be the Luddite in this conversation. Our group was mainly composed from people in Sub-Saharan Africa who found it very, very difficult to connect to Zoom. And we had a lot of people coming in and out. So we didn't really get around to discussing anything in depth beyond sort of assessing what learning management systems people have. I had a feeling that some of the discussion that we've had today was um, not quite at the right level for the participants that I had in my group as they were struggling with slightly different perspectives. Um, I think it's a really important point beyond because there is such a variability of understanding and engaging with the vocabulary, etc. Um, that perhaps needs more deeper sessions that are um, fit for the audience. So assessment informed instruction applied to ourselves as well. Um, I, we have only two minutes left. So instead of going around the room, um, please feel free to speak about points that you have, um, we haven't already made. Um, facilitators, just show up hand. Caitlin, you're nodding. Do you want you to say something? Thanks, Azia. I'll jump in quickly. From our group, uh, we had a few folks who came more from the perspective of the end users, and we talked about one thing that could be useful is kind of following the user journey of a teacher and or an administrator to understand the different digital platforms or systems that they are asked to interact with and how that does or doesn't work for them. Um, and then use that in turn to inform to our thinking about how we can use building blocks in a particular country or context. Thanks. I, I love thinking about the teacher. Um, Rachel, did you want to add anything? And um, Kay, um, Tom, you look, I said Kay, Tom, you look like you wanted to uh, contribute as well. So quickly over to you two. Sure, so, Rachel. Thanks, Tom. Our group spent some time discussing the language around building blocks mm -hmm. and how we can make sure that different decision makers have that right language to be able to engage in discussion about it and also to ensure that there is clarity about what we mean when we say that term across all the different types of users and members who might be involved in this. Thanks. And Tom, I'm afraid I'm gonna, oh, Ru Ru no, Rudolph and Tom, as fast as you can, please. Um, so one of the things that our group really uh, liked about the presentation was the focus on bringing different people with different skill sets in together and, and um, highlighting the strengths of each user group. What I think the need is, is around how we actually do that practically. It's nice to talk about the collaboration, but what mechanisms are we doing to, or, or developing to convene those different parties? Thanks, Asia. Rudolph. Um, am I on? So my group, we spoke. Ah, Rudolph's frozen at the critical moment. Shankar, did you have anything to say? Oh uh, yeah, the, uh, a unique insight was the fact that open source can be built on so, other open source. Yeah. And uh, the technical challenge is obviously a challenge of technical competency in the governments. And looking forward to, they would like to keep tab on edtech developments in Africa and requested edtech hubs uh, support in doing that. And the other idea was of the power of connecting EMIS with LMIS. Those were the things from my group. Right, thank you very much. Clearly we needed much longer than we gave ourselves time for this, which is always a good sign. It shows that um, the, the session was pitched at the right level, bearing in mind um, different, um, different needs of different components. Um, given how much input there's been um, and how much of quality input and the diversity of input, it's going to be very hard to summarize. So we commit to several things. First of all, sharing the recording and the presentations at Tech Hub will do that. Secondly, perhaps I'm um, doing a Q&A session in written format of the many questions you have and logging the points that were made 
from the jam board and for the hub to then decide how they activate this. Some of the key themes are coming through is the importance of elegance and the quality of the code. Um, so makes it user friendly for people and, um, and, and future proofly, which is linked to quality assurance of that code and having the people and the talent available to actually take that code, consider it fit for purpose within ministries. The importance of having the end user in mind from, um, from the start and supporting government capacity to be aware of the codes, to understand it and integrate it, to reflect on um, other areas of the government system that are non-educational that could be learned from to say to undertake economies of scale. And then the final two points about the importance of building for scale in that code, what might work for a few is not something that might work um, at a national level. Um, and so really thinking about that. And finally, the sustainability. So what happens when the funding stops? What happens that when that talent, um, um, that digital talent that supported the integration of those building blocks is removed. So really thinking about developing that capacity um, in country to take this forward. And I know these are some of the areas the hub is um, working on. My thanks to all of the participants, to Skeen and Yomna for um, having um, bringing this together and sharing your insights. Shanka for really making it practical and um, to Mike for um, helping us to make more sense of it. And to all of the participants who engaged so, um, so actively and been such good sports in responding. Thank you very much, everyone. And I apologize for running three minutes over. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to EdTech Hub for a wonderfully organized session. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.